Hi everyone, Alex here from Digital Foundry. In playing Far Cry 5 and examining its graphical systems and performance across platforms, we here at Digital Foundry have had a great time admiring its beauty and elegance of rendering. In playing it though, it's hard not to want to draw a comparison to its predecessors, and I spent some time playing them in preparation for my analysis of Far Cry 5's PC version. In playing them side by side and one after another, I came away with the impression that the series had changed fundamentally over the years, with Far Cry 2 being distinctly different. Going back into Far Cry 2, I at first thought it felt rather similar to the fifth game, yet the differences in tone and mechanics pile on rather rapidly. My noticing this fundamental difference, of course, is not exactly one that is original or new, as other commentators have taken up the issue. The quick glance in comparison reveals that a player in Far Cry 2 has a different type of simulation, a more hardcore one, and that that player interactivity in that world is much less constrained than it is in Far Cry 5. So what is the technological difference between Far Cry 2 and 5? And why is this so? And did the Dunya engine really get downgraded after 10 years? To get to the bottom of this difference, we need to first look back in history to see what was happening when Far Cry 2 released. See, Far Cry 2 hails from a different day and a different games industry, with different focuses on development and advertising. To put it into a tangible historical perspective, Far Cry 2's advertising and roll-up to launch heavily focused on the technical aspects of the newly crafted Dunya engine. Many months before its eventual release in October 2008, and as the public still knew very little about Far Cry 2's plot and gameplay structure as it would be in the final release, we were being shown vignettes and video slices concerning its tech during GDC 2008 in February. These were plastered all over the web at the time, and it was hard not to have seen them. The videos showcased the extensive use of real-time shadows, cloud formation and weather, and a real-time time of day system. All this at a point in time where such holistic and uncompromising systems were rather rare. Many games were still using baked shadow maps, baked lighting, or static skyboxes. These videos also showed off one of Far Cry 2's most famous aspects. Foliage was shown to be dynamic and deformable, having destructive properties where it could burn away, blacken, or be shot and hacked to pieces. These trees and brush would even eventually grow back in real time, sprouting branches and budding leaves as trees do in the real world. The game's technological simulation aspects were being presented to such a great amount of detail before the general public even had a great sense of how the game would play. This was how the game was being advertised by its technological and simulation prowess. But it was a different time, as I said. Big, expensive, and high-fidelity simulation was the talk of the town, and it was the way to get your game known. And although it was played up heavily in marketing, it was not just all talk. Vast performance and visual differences were starting to crop up in games, especially regarding PC releases as hardware grew there. Multicore was starting to actually see its integration into PC engines. DirectX 10 was being heavily pushed and marketed by Microsoft. Today, I'm kicking off a full-blown games renaissance for games for Windows, powered by three things. Firstly, a revitalized marketing effort. Secondly, the very latest in graphics technology, building even further on the DirectX technology that's powered Windows games for well over a decade, DirectX 10. The DX10 API ended up being a smokescreen of sorts and probably not exactly all that it was said to be, yet its advertisement and usage are telling. The best graphics and simulation were actively being pushed and on PC. And this technology lended itself well to a school of design which utilized it. Graphics and simulation created a sandbox of tools where the person playing could imagine and think up gameplay for themselves on the fly. And not all of that new technology served gameplay. There was also simulation for simulation's sake. Take for example the ability to break trees, limb by limb in Far Cry 2. Surely a very similar gameplay loop could be achieved just by doing the classic model swap upon a certain damage threshold. Yet simulation and emulation of the real world was becoming really popular for some reason. Engines were finally starting to be able to do these things in a performant and high fidelity manner as the hardware was there, unlike in the past, especially on PC. And the mere mechanical capability being there finally, was the reason behind utilization and proliferation. Kind of like that time when programmable shaders came into existence, if you remember, where there was a sudden overuse of shiny normal maps on every surface even though it wasn't necessary, or how Bloom was overly bright. But still, there is something edging in on the background here which explains it all so well, I can't put my finger on it. Some example which best demonstrates this change in technology and the fallout into gameplay, even more than Far Cry 2. A lightning in the bottle kind of game that exists as a watershed moment. It's called Crisis, let's take a look. A 
Crisis happened, the game which defines technology pushing gameplay systems and with such mind-bendingly insane graphics on release that games today are still playing catch up with aspects of it. How many games have procedurally breaking and touch-bending vegetation? How long did it take for filmic project motion blur to become standard? How many games even use self-shadowing, parallax, seclusion mapping, or other highly detailed technology to such an insane degree? How many games just love shoving their character technology right in your face as soon as they can? Why can I pick up this turtle? So of course Far Cry 2 has a lot of simulation for its own sake. It was what was in in 2008, and Crisis was the thing to beat. Though where that focus shines in Crisis' sandbox, Far Cry 2 arguably falters. A lot of those uncompromising simulation aspects are not exactly fun, contracting malaria for example. The Far Cry series' change in time to something which is more easily accessible, more streamlined, more performant, and accordingly runs better on more platforms, and sells more, is unsurprising. Forget not that the developers had a massive increase in RAM and GPU resources at the onset of this generation of consoles, yet not necessarily large gains in CPU processing power. This exact fact can be seen in benchmarks from the era in comparison to our very own for Far Cry 5. With the highest settings at launch, Far Cry 2 ran rather poorly on very high-end hardware. Far Cry 5, on the other hand, runs well on consoles and has an achievable 60 FPS with middle-of-the-road GPUs and CPUs at its highest settings at standard resolutions. So a massive increase in CPU simulation in comparison to Far Cry 2 was always kind of off the cards due to developer priorities and development realities. Streamlined and more GPU-focused does not mean that Far Cry 5 of course lacks sandboxy simulation. Dunya is still pulling its weight, but in a different direction this time. The volumetric fog is a great example of this. Unlike Far Cry 2, which uses a cheap screen space crepuscular ray effect, which was popular at the time, Far Cry 5 has fully volumetric, world space based, lit fog with variable density, so the sun, shadows, and any light source shine through it. The beginning of the game uses its to great effect to limit the player's movement and visibility. It obscures your line of sight, makes distant enemies unreadable, or it is just generally blinding. Technology is there, and it is influencing gameplay. The game is still full of zany, systemic gameplay moments. This is all in a truly open world, mind you, whereas Far Cry 2 is more a series of corridors connected without loading screens. The move to an actual open world is not new with Far Cry 5, as it is present in the series since the third game. Though owing to RAM increases this time, the game actually performs well on consoles, and spends a lot less time in the 20s. Less objects need constant streaming, so areas are more open, with many more objects in view at any given time. This widening of space has consequent knock-on effects, of course, like the RPG shooting in a straight line instead of parabolically. Shooting a helicopter with a slower, arching projectile might not be enjoyable. Or how there is much more AI and many more draw calls filling that larger space, leading to a competition for CPU resources, which perhaps necessitates reducing the complexity of physics simulation itself. The bottom line is that Far Cry 2's technological drive drove the development of its gameplay systems, while Far Cry 5's more mature Dunya engine is having technology and simulation being a consequence of its gameplay design. So where Far Cry 2 is unwieldy, maybe frustrating, Yet ambitious, Far Cry 5 is uncomplicated, but polished and geared towards fun. And with that being said, I would like to thank you for watching this video. If you enjoy what you saw, hit that like button, or subscribe to the channel. If you would like to discuss this with me in any capacity, write a comment below, or follow myself or Digital Foundry on Twitter. This is Alex, bidding you farewell, and auf Wiedersehen!